Welcome back to the Savillan Podcast. My name is Hike. And I'm Jeremy. What are we talking about today, Jeremy? Today we're going to get to the push for the sustainable development goals um, that we've kind of covered in the mm-hmm. last two podcasts. So last time we spoke about, you know, um, or actually in, in the previous two podcasts, two, two themes. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is Malthusianism. Uh, the other is eugenics. So Malthusianism tells you that billions of people have to go for the survival of not only mankind as a species, but for our ecology as mm-hmm. well. And then eugenics tells us uh, which people of the population should be removed yeah. um, as a result of Malthusianism. And so today we'll cover, again, uh, there, there's some pieces that we need to complete for the precursors to Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. Um, which is the plan for how they intend to get rid of all the, as they would call them, the useless mm-hmm. eaters. Yeah. And so, um, in continuing with the theme is how did all this come about? This is the backgrounding mm-hmm. story. Kind of how they set it up the whole, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. to get to the, by 2030 to have all this done. Right. And mm-hmm. remember, this again is the roundtable group organizations that are doing it. This is the offshoots of the Cecil Road Milner Group that gives rise to the Rockefeller Consortium that then... Um, uh, this world order thing kind of comes to fruition in the business space mm-hmm. um, because uh, we always want to you know, keep this idea in play that there is the mystery religion element of it. And I think that's, you know, a far more important piece, but this is necessary to go through from mm-hmm. the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Before we get into it, we'll do our house keeping there you go almost <laughs> clean <clinic> again yeah <laughs> we want to thank everybody for watching yeah. liking subscribing uh leaving feedback we really appreciate it yeah. uh if you want to support a podcast you can go to the iconic mm-hmm. where you can get t-shirts hoodies hats and package deals and yeah. package deals yeah. yeah or you can go to patreon.com slash the iconic podcast where you get all the episodes first yep. before they come to the youtube and you can uh, choose a tier at which level you want to support yeah. And uh, yeah, we're on all the major platforms. Uh, so we have a link tree who.b slash iconic, um, which is a truncated list of all the different mm-hmm. platforms. Yeah, but we're pretty to. much on all the other ones. Just look up the iconic podcast and you should be able to find us. Yep, and we have a YouTube highlights channel as mm-hmm. well, so you can get smaller, digestible bites of all this stuff cut up into smaller pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, we should also mention that, you know, we take pieces from um, uh, the podcast and cut them up and put them as excerpts on a reel for mm-hmm. Instagram as well. Yep. Yeah. I think that's it, right? I think that that's about said. it, yeah. yeah we're going to show some of our notes. Again, for anybody that's new, we like to show some of our notes just to uh, make it easier for people to follow. If you're watching the video, if you're listening, you can go always to the YouTube channel and mm. we show the notes. So if you need to take anything down for yourself, for your notes, yep. it's easy to do or easier to follow because we know it's dense, it's a lot of information, and we're trying to get all this out so we can get to the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so all of this is kind of like, um, you know, we, we would we would like to cover some of the current stuff mm-hmm. because the current stuff helps us connect to, to all these, um, uh, a- not ancient events, but um, historical events. And so once you understand how this stuff has been set up, uh, it's easy easy to see um how they're um how how a they're able to so easily persuade people of the ideas that they're trying to put in play but b um you can see the the plan that they had in the background for Mm -hmm. such a long time come to fruition yeah it really answers a lot of questions when you're like how are we in this state you know when you 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 look at people it's like how how did you (laughs) get here (laughs) you know and this answers a lot of it Right, right So with that, uh, let's go mm-hmm. ahead and get into it. And so um, last time we left off, uh, we we're kind of digging through some of the history of the setup for environmentalism and how the Rockefeller Consortium was involved in the setting mm-hmm. up of the major roundtable organizations. We mentioned briefly that um, you have a hierarchy amongst those um, roundtable groups. So the Club of Rome to the Royal Institute of International Affairs to the Council on Foreign Relations mm-hmm. here in the, in the United States. And um, how they've kind of contrived this whole idea of climatism, climate change, in order to bring about this global government idea that they have, uh, which is the the coming to fruition of this uh, the Cecil Rhodes Milner dream, as mm-hmm. Carol Quigley would call it. Right. Um, and so here we go. Uh, the Vancouver uh, Declaration on the Human Settlements. Uh, this is um, this is an excerpt. General principles. 
uh, starting with number 10, land, as we mentioned last time in the previous um, podcast, that land ownership is going to be the, the thing that's going to be demonized mm-hmm. going forward uh, because it's going to be considered uh, for those who are the privately holding land, uh, you're actually contributing to social injustices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and as Pope says, it's a secondary right to own land, right? It's a secondary yeah. right. So it, it, this idea that it all should be communalized, mm-hmm. right? So so again, if we remember from the rise of the middle class, uh, we which we covered maybe like three, four podcasts yeah. ago uh, at this point, that through revolutions, that, that's what we get, you know, uh, people are able to have land, yeah. keep wealth, and then now they're taking that away. Yep, so... Uh, just uh, to kind of rehash a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. So you get this idea that middle class uh, is birth from the Industrial Revolution. Now that the people are healthier, they're wealthier, they're passing down mm-hmm. their wealth generationally. Um, you need something to get rid of that. You need a yeah. fourth Industrial Revolution to, uh, to invert what the Industrial Revolution did. Uh, but at the same time, you need to gut the current wealth of the middle class. Mm-hmm. And this is why you see all these uh, ridiculous expenditures on things like COVID and mm-hmm. things like... Um, Wars and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. The war on terror, the yeah. war in Iraq, mm-hmm. and so forth. Uh, and then uh, also another thing that we mentioned, once the middle class starts rising, how when the population would it also grows and how it becomes a problem. So also here we can see that having an agenda such as uh, the depopulation one is very important. It's a lot harder to control 26 million people like France had back in the time than when it was a lot smaller and manageable, you know? These are mounts to feed. These are people with demands and... uh, yeah, you and so the important that. piece was uh, they were wealthy. And mm-hmm. They could put, they wanted to participate in their political future. They were rivals to mm-hmm. monarchy. They were getting is, educated. They were living longer. They were having more offsprings, right? right. Yeah. And they were passing down their education and wealth generationally. Mm-hmm. And so to get rid of them, you need a fourth industrial revolution where you replace the thing you that undo made them. all that, right? Yeah. yeah. So you take away all the things that made them what they mm-hmm. became. And uh, you take them systematically away from it while at the same time you're mm-hmm. going to r- reduce their wealth through inflation and things like mm-hmm. that. So, yeah, no no next generation, no education, dumbing down, yeah. and then all that stuff, which we'll cover again. Yep. And so um, going through this doc, uh, again, this is the Vancouver Declaration on Human Settlements. Uh, land is one of the fundamental elements in human settlements. Every state has the right to take the necessary steps to maintain under public control this is public control mm-hmm. and use, right? Possession, disposal, and, and reservation of land. Mm-hmm. And so every state has the right to plan and regulate the use of land, which is one of the most important resources. In such a way, the growth of the population centers, both urban and rural, are based on comprehensive land use plans. And so such measures must assure uh, the attainment of the basic goals of social and economic reform for every country. Who who, who, who is dictating this to every country of the world? So in conformity with its national and land tenure system and legislation. Mm -hmm. And so you already get the the way that these things are worded as if there's already this uh, global entity that's that's, uh, it's speaking as if it it sounds like a decree, right? Yeah. 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 Send it to the farthest of the land. Let them know. Yeah. Now think about it. If it sounds like that, remember the system was going to come full circle when we get back to this feudalistic mm-hmm. system kings who will make decrees and the things will be carried out uh, like it was in the five to fifteen hundred yeah. uh, time period and so um you, you know who else is also uh, saying that owning private property like marx lenin mao and the united nations how this thing is kind of like a social injustice well the pope mm-hmm. <laughs> is in <laughs> yeah and and fratelli tutti The right to private property can only be considered a secondary natural right derived from the principle of the universal destination of created goods. This has concrete consequences that ought to be reflected in the workings of society. Yet, it often happens that secondary rights displace primary and overriding rights in practice making them irrelevant mm. and so there's always somebody behind somebody that mm-hmm. you know um, is the mouthpiece to the world and you get this exoteric versus esoteric doctrine and um, it, it's just an interesting piece that'll pop mm-hmm. up later because you'll see that there is there are movers and shakers behind um, even the what we would consider the strongest world leaders even if we disagree with what they actually mm-hmm. did on the timeline 
1980, the United Nations Environmental Program, founded by Maurice Strong, produces the World Conservation Strategy. World Conservation Strategy, Living Resource Conservation for Sustainable Sustainable Development. Development. Well, who prepared it? It was prepared by the International Union of Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. Right, so IUCN, uh, with uh, the advice, cooperation, and financial assistance of the United Nations Environmental Program, Mm -hmm. or UNEP, and the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, in collaboration with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, FAO, and the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. Mm. And so we have all these uh, United Nations organizations coming together to produce uh, what we find on page 59. The most accurate climactic problem However, is carbon dioxide accumulation is a result of the burning of fossil fuel, Bad. deforestation, and changes in land use. Um, at present rates of increase, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide may produce a significant warming of the lower atmosphere before the middle of the next century, particularly in the polar mm. region, regions, right? So, yeah, this, we learned in a previous podcast that it's going to go by not six times, but three times that, right? right bad right. carbon, bad <laughs> right. carbon. And so that you get this uh, six degree increase mm-hmm. uh, Celsius uh, all, all the way around. And so this warming would probably change temperature patterns throughout most of the world, benefiting some benefiting some regions and mm. damaging others, possibly severely. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, so it seems like it balances itself yeah. out, right? So if it benefits one region uh, and it damages another region, um, you get kind of like this this um, balancing out effect. And so 1987, Our Common Future, the Brundtland Report. Uh, this is a report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, Our Common Future. Mm-hmm. So 1987, this is where we finally start to get the definitions of what they think sustainable development actually is mm-hmm. or means. And so they give a definition. It says, it's the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Mm -hmm. And so as we move forward, 1987, the Fourth World Wilderness Congress Mm -hmm. in Colorado, David Rockefeller finally speaks on the need for partnership. His purpose was to reiterate important points uh, that were made elsewhere. Well, what were these important points? Mm -hmm. Obviously, they have an agenda. It's the role of carbon dioxide. Mm, that's interesting. The need for a world conservation bank. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was that. This is a reiteration, right? So, mm-hmm. make environmental concerns an integral part of all economic decisions. Mm. This is this seems to be coming to fruition in our time, as if uh, these, um, as if M- Mr. Rockefeller was prophetic in a sense, right? And so, as we see today, uh, corporations across the globe are making sustainable development mm-hmm. goals, i.e., this whole environmental concern. Yeah, uh, but at that time, he's just a rich man, right? Imagine Bill Gates come out, which you know we've seen him do. But <laughs> I'm just saying for those that don't think think Bill Gates is a good philanthropist, and goes like, "Hey, everybody from now on has to do this or that." And you're like, "Excuse right. me, sir, go sell some Microsoft, right?" right yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, 1991, the Club of Rome produces the first global revolution. This Mm -hmm. is by Alexander King and Bernard Schneider. And it says on page 115, the common enemy of humanity is man. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea (laughs) that pollution, the threat of global warming, Mm -hmm. water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. All of these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is only through changed attitudes Mm -hmm. and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. The Club of Rome, first global revolution. And so this quote, uh, we we put in communist aversion, uh, I think, too, Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's obviously kind of like they're they're showing the hand at this point, right? So... um, and, and we mentioned previously this laundry list of, of 21 publications that were produced. And so mm. when scientific you fu- publications, scientific, don't forget, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff we can trust. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the, these these tacit admissions here, mm-hmm. right, the common enemy of man in searching for a new enemy. To we unite. came up with right. and then gas- gaslighted them to think that they're the problem. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, it's uh, interesting. 1991. And, uh, but, and then they're going to call us the conspiracy theorists. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's why it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> 
1991, Caring for the Earth, a Strategy for Sustainable Living. It says, this is a strategy for a kind of development that provides real improvements in Mm -hmm. the quality of human life and at the same time conserves the vitality and diversity of the Earth. The goal uh, is development that is there that will be sustainable. Mm-hmm. And so, you know. They'll do really good nowadays because the buzzwords, they have it down. You know, yeah. you, you drop them off from there to like, I don't know, San Francisco or New York or something. You won't even know that they're from the old times. Right. Yep. Wow. And so th- there's nothing new in, mm-hmm. in our times, right? This is, this is the history of it. Right? Exactly. So. Yeah, but nobody else was talking like that. It was them, right? But now the commoners at the, yeah, those yeah. areas, that's how they talk. Right? So, so now they, they, they get to a point where, you know, they've been hammering these ideas. Mm-hmm. When we see who's a part of the roundtable organizations, it's going to be all your guys that are in news. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. when nobody, um, you know, like if you think about like the average person that just goes to work every day, they're not being bombarded with like mm-hmm. uh, sustainable yeah. development stuff. They, they don't know the buzzwords. Exactly. And, they're told the buzzwords in these speeches that are provided by either politicians or the mm-hmm. news media, which are CFR corporate sponsors. Yep. And if that's the case, then they're roundtable owned mm-hmm. sponsors, right? And so 1992, this is the Global Biodiversity Strategy Policymakers Guide. Yeah, this is a what? It's the Policymakers mm-hmm. Guide. Okay. Uh, it's produced by who? Who, who, who? who contributed to this thing? So it's the World Resource Institute, the WRI, mm-hmm. the World Conservation Union, right? Mm-hmm. IUCN, the United Nations Environmental Program, or UNEP, in consultation with the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And it says the global biodiversity strategy was developed through a process of research and consultation beginning in 1989 mm-hmm. and involving six consultations, six workshops, and more than, uh, I was expecting another six there, but mm-hmm. <laughs> more than 500 individuals. It would have been too obvious. Yeah, it would have been way too <laughs> obvious, right? So, again, this policymaker's guide, mm-hmm. um, guide to the strategy, provides an overview of the actions needed to respond to the, the needs for biodiversity conservation worldwide. Mm-hmm. 1992, the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, CBD, uh, known informally as the Biodiversity Convention, is a multilateral treaty. It has three main goals. Well, mm-hmm. what are these three main goals? Well, the conservation of biological diversity or biodiversity, the sustainable use of of its components mm-hmm. and the fair and equitable these terms there are there. Yeah. <laughs> sharing of benefits arising from genetic resources mm-hmm. um so yeah so uh, if you're familiar with with like a lot of these terms and uh, and today how the all this stuff is kind of being spun um, it's almost as if somebody's copying, um, imagine like a, you can read a document and if you're familiar with like the document, uh, what they based what it they, on, uh-huh. it's almost like plagiarism. Yeah. Almost. So, so, you know, it has that, it doesn't really have that feel, but it has that, like, if you understand all this stuff behind the scenes and you hear somebody talking about this stuff today, you like, you, Oh, I know where you get that from. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know exactly where it comes uh-huh. from. Right. So it's, it's, it's no secret. And because most of this stuff is off the grid for most people, it's kind of like, you know, climate the, the whole climate discussion mm-hmm. focuses on the last you know let's say they're like oh you know like all, it, it focuses on the last five to ten years of mm-hmm. talking points that came from these guys yeah right so and it's hard to have those type of conversations because this stuff is is so old and people don't know like mm-hmm. going back to to read all the because a lot of this stuff is dense reading uh, again if you go through those 21 um uh, uh, different publications that were produced that we named earlier. Uh, that's a lot of reading, right? T- to get to the point mm-hmm. where you can then read and understand what yeah. they meant by sustainable <laughs> development, right? So um, I guess that's kind of like our uh, position here is to kind of like just, hey, th- let's touch on a little bit. Let's let the people know that it's actually there. And if they decide to go do their mm-hmm. own research, then by yeah, all means. Again, bring all the information to the table, right? And let that's the it. rational person make the decision. That's all. Yeah. That's all we can do, right? So. Um, 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Mm. uh, established an international environmental treaty to combat dangerous uh, dangerous human interference with the climate system, in part by stabilizing greenhouse gas. So this is going to be the Mm -hmm. demonization of greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. 
And so it was signed by 154 states at the mm. United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, or UNICED, uh, informally known as the Earth Summit. And so 1992, we're still in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, we get the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change document where the purpose was what? It says the ultimate objective of the convention and uh, and any related legal instruments that the conference of the parties may adopt to, uh, is to achieve in accordance with the relevant provisions of the convention stabilization of greenhouse mm -hmm. gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Mm -hmm. mm. So now... These greenhouse gases are going up there. Um, it's interfering with the climate system. Um, we need to start partnering with not only the nation states, but the corporations to kind of solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Because, the, you know, Gaia is in need of our help. And um, we, we need to put the policies in place. Again, we're not really saying that these are laws. Mm -hmm. We're going to sign treaties. Yeah. And we're going to advise on policy. And there's a definite hierarchy, as we've already mentioned. It's so just create like uh, for these lawmakers, you know, stuff for uh, like uh, what's her name, um, Hillary Clinton. Uh -huh. when, you know, when she said, "Now I don't have to go far to be told what to do." You know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she's uh, speaking of uh, the Council on Foreign Relations' mm -hmm. new uh, office. And so the document says such a level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change mm -hmm. to ensure that food production is not threatened to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. And so when you start putting all these uh, A, talking points out, B, uh, what end up being policy points, C, what end up being um, guys who are on both sides of the aisle, meaning mm -hmm. like, uh, yes, they're at the roundtable group. They're, they're a roundtable group member. They're there drafting up policy. They're then taking that policy back to um, the, the, the whatever constituent nation that they're at. They introduce it to like parliament or Congress. Uh, it gets voted and it gets passed because the majority members that are there mm -hmm. are also members of the roundtable organizations, yeah. right? So they know who, uh, where it's coming from. They know where it's going. Yeah. Right, yeah, They're just yeah. fulfilling their role. And right. here we work on this. And they have to keep in play this idea that the current people that are in democratic or, or constitutional republics are still able to participate mm -hmm. in their political future. And people wonder why, hey, how come it doesn't matter if we vote in the guy that's on the right or the guy that's on the left. Mm -hmm. The same stuff it, it, it happens and yeah. nothing seems to change. It's and you just end up with some upset people and that's it, right? You're just kind of like voting for the next person that's going to upset you. <laughs> yeah, right. or, or somebody that you know, imagine they, they tell you this type of it because there's talking points if you're speaking to uh, somebody on the right or there's talking points for the people on the left, right? So, and uh, as we said before, if, if it's all just different fingers on the same hand, mm -hmm. it's connected to the same brain, yeah. right? So it doesn't matter which, if you choose the thumb, the index finger, or the you pinky. You just select a finger. You right. never elect the hand. There you go, mm -hmm. right? Um and so now you get this idea that, you know, these ecosystems are going to adapt naturally to climate change. Uh, and then they provide the following definitions. They say, for the purpose of this convention, uh, number two, climate change means a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and which is in addition to natural climate variability observed or comparable uh, time periods. And so number three, climate system then means uh, the totality of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, geosphere, and their interactions. And then four, emissions means the release of greenhouse gases and or their precursors um, into the atmosphere over a specified area and or period of time and period of time. And then number five, greenhouse gases means those gaseous constituents of the atmosphere, both natural and anthropogenic that absorb and readmit infrared radiation. And so this is the going to be the whole, um, the environment's going to get warmer because all of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, greenhouse gases are trapping all this radiation. And so um, everything was leading up to this summit. So 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, Earth Summit 2, UNICED, or simply the, what's known as the Rio Conference in Rio de Janeiro. 
This happened in Brazil, uh, the 3rd through the 14th in 1992 of June. And so, and it produced the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. Hmm. Uh, so the idea there um, is we quote, reaffirming the Declaration of the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment adopted at Stockholm. Remember in the hmm. two podcasts ago, we spoke of the, the Stockholm Conference uh, on June 16, 1972, seeking to build upon uh, the goal of establishing a new and equitable, there's those hmm. terms again, global partnership through the creation of, it, of new levels of cooperation among states so you're going to get the you know they're going to keep going higher and higher and higher with these these agreements between nation states and then because they're they're basically they're weaving the sovereignty of all these nation states into this tapestry of this Mm -hmm. global uh, state idea um, and to key sectors of societal society and people working towards international agreements with respect to the interest of all and protect the integrity of the global environment and developmental system, recognizing the integral and interdependent nature of the earth, uh, our home. Mm. And so interdependence is going to be a thing that's uh, going to be a reoccurring theme in this whole idea because... You, so we depend on earth and our earth depends on us? Well, not idea. only that, you have this idea that, you know, nation states are willfully, you know, scaling back some of their production mm-hmm. capabilities to, to, to willfully become interdependent yeah. with other nations. And so this is going to create a pain point like we see today with this whole idea of uh, Ukraine being the breadbasket and Ukraine being this place where you get lithium lithium mm-hmm. <laughs> so for for this whole green new deal you're gonna have electrons you're gonna storm in what batteries that are made from lithium and so uh, if something affects um uh, one portion of this entire panoply mm-hmm. then in the th- member state then everybody kind of feels the pain yeah right and so well then the people that are on the, the boots on the ground are going to be the people that are going to cry out and say hey you know um the supply chain is disrupted we, we're not able to get you mm-hmm. know whatever xyz baby formula or mm-hmm. whatever XYZ product it is. And that's going to not only be here in the States, it's going to be felt mm-hmm. around the world. And so you're going to get this uh, universal cry out to, for, mm-hmm. for an international governing body to do something yeah. about this. Right? So, we had cheap shortages. We had food shortages. We had yeah. gas shortages. We had yeah. meat shortages. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so, uh, so now this is what you're going to get is these 27 principles. Uh, not all are included here. I uh, kind of spared the audience that, right? So I think uh, this is a good place to stop for, for this particular podcast. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll spare the audience the, the, the principles for now. We'll jump into the principles on the other side of, um, on, or on the other, po- the next podcast. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, thanks for everybody for joining. Mm-hmm. Uh, stay up to date with everything iconic by following us on all of our social media. For, um, um, don't forget to, to like, subscribe, comment, and share. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tell them how they can stay in touch with us. Yep, yeah, you you can find us pretty much everywhere in every uh, social media, but mainly we're active on the main ones like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, and uh, if you need to find all the other ones, you can just look up the iconic podcast right, yeah. anywhere else, any new platform that pops out, we're there. Uh, or you can go to uh, our link tree, which is who.b slash iconic, yep. and you can find like the shortened version of right. all those links in there. Yep. You can also uh, support us uh, by going to the iconic label.com where you can get yourself a hat, hoodie, t shirt, um, or you can go to patreon.com slash the iconic podcast. Yep. And um, you get to have all the podcasts first. You know, you have the first right to all the episodes. Um, and um, the highlights yeah. channel. Yeah, and the highlights channel. Yep. We have a highlights channel, the iconic uh, highlights. Mm hmm. Uh, where the idea, yeah, good. We will make uh, smaller digestible bites of the podcast into smaller segments. So, um, uh, just keeping in, in with the theme of like it's a lot of information to pack mm-hmm. into you know um, a, a, an hour or two hour podcast. Yeah. That's that's a lot to follow. And so we'll make it uh, smaller portions, more digestible. We'll also cut up uh, even shorter pieces, about a minute long, to go on the reels that are be on either TikTok or Instagram. Uh, Instagram yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think that's that's it. it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.